I am Joni Ernst. I am a mother. I am a soldier. We have to address those problems, and we need to look at many options out there. I haven't endorsed one option over another. Congressman Braley is proposing by raising the minimum wage. It's not an answer. Um, we have to come up with other options to put on the table. When it comes to the economy, I have my own way of addressing the economy, which is exactly what we have done here in Iowa, which the Iowa way again is working. And that's utilizing those policies that I have implemented with uh, Governor Terry Branstad, a good friend and supporter. The first is by lowering taxes on all hardworking Iowa. I have not endorsed any, any tax plan, so I want to make that very clear. Uh, I do believe that we need to lower taxes immediately. The amendment that is being referenced uh, by the congressman would not do any of the things that you stated it would do. That amendment is simply a You're statement right. that... Gazette did a fact check on the amendment that you introduced and said that it would do all the things that I said it would. That it would ban forms of contraception, it would prevent people from getting in vitro fertilization, and you personally said that doctors who perform those procedures under your bill should be prosecuted. That's the reality, and that's what the Cedar Rapids Gazette said. And that is only if legislation would be passed. Uh, so I, I don't know the science behind climate change. I can't say one way or another. Braley, you're not running. I, you're not running against these other people. You're running against me. I am a mother. I am a soldier. Is, is there a country receiving aid from the United States that you would cut? I would have to. The U.S. widening the campaign against ISIS launching airstrikes near the Haditha Dam, that's northwest of Baghdad, about 125 miles closer to the Syrian border, that is. This is the number of U.S. troops in Iraq rise above 1,000 for the first time in three years. National Security Correspondent Jennifer Griffin, the Pentagon there. And Jennifer, good morning to you. The beginning of another busy week. How did U.S. military involvement in Iraq shift over the weekend? Well, Bill, the Pentagon denies it is mission creep and says this weekend's airstrikes around the Haditha Dam expanded the U.S. airstrikes now to a fourth location. Remember, the strike started as a way to help the Yazidis on Mount Sinjar. Then they expanded to include the Mosul Dam and then the strikes to help the Iraqi military and Kurdish Peshmerga retake the town of Amerli. The U.S. Air Force used fighter jets and bombers this weekend to carry out more than 10 airstrikes around Haditha Dam, the country's second largest dam. The US is essentially flying air support for the Iraqi military, which does not have a functioning air force. It's a new strike around that dam, Aditha Dam, but it isn't anything different from what the president has said in his guidance uh, to the military and what our parameters are, protect the interests of Americans and the infrastructure that would protect Americans. The number of U.S. troops in Iraq has now risen to more than 1,000 for the first time since the U.S. returned to Iraq since pulling out in 2011. Secretary of State John Kerry raised eyebrows last week when he suggested that the 350 U.S. troops that the Pentagon approved to protect the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad, those were the new troops approved last week, uh, they were in fact military advisors. That is not what they were officially requested to do, Bill. Uh, there is an election next week in Iraq. How significant is the Iraqi parliament? Parliament's meeting today in Baghdad. Well, essentially, Bill, it's a very significant meeting because essentially it's where the prime minister designate Haider al-Abadi has until Wednesday to form a new government. Otherwise, there will be yet another constitutional crisis in Iraq. Without a government, it's very difficult for the U.S. to know who these U.S. airstrikes are helping. Remember, al-Abadi was the compromise choice from the Shia bloc. His elevation forced Nouri al-Maliki, the former prime minister, to step aside. All bets are off if he can't form a government, Bill. And Jennifer, thank you. Jennifer Griffin, the Pentagon. It was nearly four years ago today that Charlie Baker had to admit defeat in the 2010 race for governor. That would not be the case this time, as Charlie Baker is now the newly elected governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Tonight the voters said yes. <laughs> Though Martha Coakley did not officially concede last night, all five major television networks called the election in favor of Baker.
In his victory speech, he did not criticize Coakley for a decision. In fact, he reminded supporters that every vote counts. I talked to her a couple minutes ago, and she said she really wants to wait till the morning to see the final results. Hey, that's fine. That's fine. In politics, in elections, every vote counts. Throughout the night, the poll showed Baker and Coakley in a narrow race, but supporters remained confident even when he was down. Well, I actually see him as uh, making a lot of steps forward uh, since 2010. Uh, he's really connected with the people. He's been able to uh, put a, a friendly face forward, and I think that makes a big difference. He also received support from former Governor Bill Weld, whom Charlie worked for from 1991 to 1997. As the night turned into morning and still no signs of retreating from Coakley, supporters grew restless. But Charlie reminded them what they'd been waiting for. Across the Commonwealth, in every region, in every town, in every community, to build the great Massachusetts that we all dream and hope for. Reporting from the Seaport Hotel in Boston, I'm Paul Dudley. The stream media seem to be wringing their hands over how to identify Private Bradley Manning. This after he was sent away to, to, for a long prison stretch for his leaking of classified documents to WikiLeaks. The former, armory, the former Army intelligence analyst now says he wants to be known as Chelsea Manning and says he hopes to undergo female hormone therapy while in prison. So is he a him or a her? Witness this exchange on the Today Show. Is there a chance that she, as we're now referring to her, would be then transferred at some point to a woman's prison? I think it would be far down the road, and probably if she had that sex reassignment surgery that we don't know if she actually wants. And by the way, the Army has said it doesn't provide hormone therapy or gender surgery, so if they want to go down that road, they're going to have to sue to get there probably. So doesn't that mean she is going to remain a he for a very long time? Let's talk about it with our News Watch panel. Judith Miller is the Pulitzer Prize winning investigative reporter and author. Kirsten Power is a Daily Beast columnist. Both are Fox News contributors. Judy, what do you think about this controversy? Well, this controversy has sent editors scurrying to the AP style book to see what it says about it. You know, look, the media are plural, and they have divided down the middle. MSNBC was very quick to say we're going to call him a her. This gives new meaning to the term he said, she said. But basically the New York Times, most newspapers are still using the he because, as the Times said, we really don't want to spring this on somebody, a reader who's been used to hearing Bradley Manning referred to as a he. He still has male equipment, uh, Kirsten. <laughs> yes. Why not call him a man? Yeah, well, it's, it, that, I think that seems right. I think as long as he is a man, he should be referred to as a man. I, I understand that there's an argument that be, he sh people should be able to be called what they call themselves. But if you think about that, what if people just start deciding all of a sudden Judy says, I demand that you refer to me only as he. I mean, there, there does seem to, there should be some correlation between reality and how you're referring to a person. Well, from now on, I would like to be referred to as your royal highness, <laughs> right. okay? And how about your eminence? That, that, that sounds <laughs> that even too. better. Yeah, I mean, what is this political correctness gone amok here? Well, the AP style book does say that, you know, we go in general with, with what the person wishes to be called, and if the person's physical attributes support that so it kind of splits it down the middle uh, look this is going to go on I think it, the situation will evolve there's a bigger issue here which is should the American taxpayer pay for Bradley Manning's the, sex change the election? army is saying no no way but you know is there going to be a lawsuit I, I suppose probably <laughs> well I don't know enough about the medical facts behind this and I, I, I wouldn't make light of it I think it, could, it, it is a pretty serious thing as I understand it and if it is a true medical condition and they cover other medical conditions and I would say that it should be covered and I, I know a lot of people are sort of rolling their eyes but I think there was a lot of yes. suffering there is yes. a lot of suffering that goes along I think with a lot of people who are confronted with this. well it's well, clear that the army ignored this before the fact and did that affect his behavior that you know has left him in Leavenworth maybe who knows but, but it didn't come up a lot of the uh, but you know there are cynics out there and maybe i'm one of them who say maybe this is all part of a, a a plan to get you know early release or parole or a new trial or something 
by maintaining some kind of a ruse here that, that isn't necessarily the case. No, I, I think that he made it clear, his lawyers made it clear in the beginning. There's emails, there's, there's really correspondence with the Army about this issue. This was a troubled young guy. Whether or not that exonerates or you know, justifies what he did, obviously the courts found no. The military court said no. All right, let's turn our attention to the other story that uh, we're paying attention to. Samantha Power, the president's representative to the, United, uh, to the United Nations, ambassador to the United Nations, was not there when uh, the Syrian vote took place. The Syrian issue was presented to the United Nations. This after roughly a thousand people, perhaps more, died in what the uh, Syrian rebels are calling a gas attack, a chemical weapons attack. The question is, where is Samantha Power? Uh, she may have been on a trip, whether that's a vacation, we don't exactly know. But Kirsten, what do you think? I mean, Rick Grinnell says, look, you know, she is the president's representative. She's a human rights advocate. She should have been there for something this important. Well, it's the, so it's the end of August. A lot of people go on vacation during that time. I, I don't know where she is, but it's not unreasonable to think she may have a long planned vacation. She may be out of the country. Um, and I, I don't think we can read into that to mean that she's not engaged. And she sent her deputy, who um, I presume she has confidence in. And so I, it, it, it's, it seems a little unfair to me, honestly. I think she is very engaged on the issue. And, uh, you know, but it's hard to know also without knowing exactly where she is. Well, and that's why I think we wonder, shouldn't the State Department provide a little bit more information yeah, about where should. she is? I mean, people can understand if you're yeah. on vacation, you've had a exactly. you've booked a trip, nobody wants to, you know, pay the airline <laughs> fees. We get it. Well, but why don't they tell us that? Well, especially because the State Department spokesman said, and in the interests of transparency, before <laughs> saying she wasn't going to reveal where Samantha Power was. That, look, this was a very important moment, and she's been on the job 19 days. If she's on vacation, she owes it to the American people to say that. I remember, you know, my first job, I didn't get a vacation for <laughs> a year. I mean, you had to work a while before you were, were entitled to a vacation. Well, I mean, I, she strikes me as somebody who, who works a lot, and she's been in different positions in the administration and she does have a child and a husband and you right. know I want to I think people should be allowed to spend time with their families and you can't plan international crises um, so uh, like I said it, I think that they should be more straightforward with it absolutely at the State Department um, but I think that she can do what she needs to do probably from wherever she is well but the question we often ask on this panel if a Republican president <laughs> UN envoy didn't show up for a big vote wouldn't that person be hammered in the media uh, yes. <laughs> that I think so. <laughs> but that would be unfair. Yes. Okay. All right. There you have it. Kirsten Powers, Judy Miller. Thank Hi. you. Heather.